Good evening to our Semester at Sea community. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment of our Wavelengths alumni series. This new online series highlights the talents of our SAS alumni around the world. We feature alum from different industry or career fields each week on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Mountain Time here on our official SAS Facebook page. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Michelle Pino. I am a very proud SAS alum. I sailed as staff on the fall 07 voyage, and I've been serving as the Alumni Association's chapter rep for Los Angeles since 2012. This evening, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Lewis Patler. He first sailed with SAS in the fall of 1970 as the youngest faculty member who had been hired at the time. He now serves on the Alumni Association's Parents Council, and he has had three generations of his family sail on SAS. Hi, everybody. A little more about our guest. Louis Patler holds a PhD in sociology and has lectured at Stanford University, the University of San Francisco, Notre Dame, and multiple voyages on semester at sea as a faculty member and as an interport lecturer. Louis is a New York Times, NASDAQ, Book of the Month, and Amazon number one best-selling author, speaker, and consultant. He's the president of the BIT Group, a strategic business consulting trend analysis and training company. That's a lot of words. A lot of words. He has written more than 100 articles and authored five books about entrepreneurship and best business practices. In addition to serving on the Semester at Sea Alumni Association, he also serves on the advisory boards of the Council on Global Innovation and Entrepreneurship of the Henry Ford Museum of American Innovation located in Dearborn, Michigan. And finally, a fun fact, Louie was a former professional baseball prospect. He has won six amateur baseball World Series championship rings and was inducted into the Bay Area MSBL Baseball Hall of Fame in 2020. So we are so excited to speak with you today. Thank you for being our guest. And should we jump right into it, Louis? Let's do it. Let's do it. All Thank right. you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thanks to Semester C for inviting me. It's always like being with family when I get any chance to do anything at all that has to do with Semester at C. Um, I guess uh, I should start with um, how I how I came to be affiliated with this extended family that we all know about. Um, I was um, out of high school just after turning 17. I was out of UCLA when I was 21 and I finished my doctoral studies um, and, and um, was what they call all but dissertation in academic uh, places, ABD. Um, by the time I got into that point, having raced through everything, um, the ABD for me stood for anxious, burned out, and disillusioned. Um, I like probably some of you. I, I was getting near the end of all that academic stuff, and I didn't have a clue as to what was going to come next. I had never traveled. I was the first person in my family to go to college, let alone to graduate school. Um, and it sort of hit me: What's to become of me? What do I do? What do I do now? Um, I'm almost done. So I'm walking down the hallway at Wayne State University, where I was doing my PhD work. My uh, my doctoral studies, incidentally, might interest you because it's unfortunately still a very hot topic. I was studying political violence in America and I was doing a dissertation. My dissertation was comparing the Black Panther Party with the uh, Students for a Democratic Society and the Weather Underground in terms of their, their activities and tactics. So um, at any rate, I was walking down the hallway uh, one day in, in the uh, university, in the sociology department, and I saw this poster, it said, World Campus Afloat. Um, I had no idea what that meant. I stopped and paused for a moment, and I, and I looked at it, and I kind of figured out what it was, a university on a ship, and I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, I want to do that. So I, uh, those days pre-Wi-Fi, <laughs> there were tear off tabs where you had phone numbers. So I called Chapman College and I talked to this, it, it phone rings, and I talked to this sweet lady who's the secretary to the Dean who was gonna be hiring for the ship. And um, she says, hello, how are you? And I said, fine, I'd like to, I'd like to apply for a 
teaching position on this world campus afloat. She said, well, that's delightful. You sound young and, and, and energetic. We, we need those kinds of folks. So um, she said, tell me about yourselves. How much, um, how much teaching experience have you had? And I said, well, um, actually none. Uh, and she paused and she said, well, how about publications? And I said, well, actually zip, none. I, I haven't done that either. I'm just, I'm just ABD um, and I'm young. And she, she laughed, she said, well, look, you sound like the kind of person we would like to have with us at some point, but um, don't hold your breath. Uh, it's a very competitive situation. I, she says, I'm obligated to send you the application form, uh, but um, you know, get, we'll get in touch. So I said to her, well, that'll probably work out because I've also, you know, I'm gonna to apply to the Peace Corps. So uh, I get accepted to the Peace Corps. I'm supposed to go to Ethiopia. Uh, and, and this is like in June, I get accepted. I'm supposed to report in August to go to Eth the training for Ethiopia. And I'm clearing out my stuff, starting to pack somewhere around uh, early August. And I come to this manila folder that has the application forms for, for World Campus Afloat. So I thought, I might as well just do this. By the time I'm done with the Peace Corps, everything will be cool. And maybe I'll have a shot. So long story short, I fill out the form. Um, I'm going to put it in the mail and then I stop to pause for a moment and I'm thinking to myself, what possible competitive advantage might I have other, other, over other applicants? So I have reproduced for you all uh, what I did. I wrote this very thoughtful cover letter over the top of which I wrote in red felt pen these words, uh, I can leave with 24 hours notice. The only thing I felt I had going for me was the fact I was completely mobile. Um, and so I mailed it in with a smile on my face, went about my merry way. Um, and then uh, on a Friday afternoon in September, the phone rings and guess who is calling? It's the sweet secretary to the Dean of uh, World Campus Afloat for the Fall 70 Voyage. And she says, do you remember me? And I said, of course I do. She said, um, well, I have a question to pose to you. Uh, we, we pulled out uh, uh, some files today because our social science professor had a stroke this morning and we are sailing on Monday. Were you serious? I remembered what you said that you could leave with 24 hours notice. I'm giving you 24 hours notice. Will you do it? And so, my mom used to say, your life can change in an afternoon. Never really understood that until I paused, took a deep breath and said to her, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but I'll do it. And that's how I got affiliated with, with Semester at Sea in the first place. Um, they hired me, I had no, no, uh, I had no passport or anything, but here I am um, looking uh, quite my age and for that period of time, um, and that's uh, some of you were recognized at the top of Table Mountain in Cape Town. Um, I look just the same now, don't I? As, as I did then, right? There's, there's almost no difference. I think our viewers would agree you haven't aged a day. Not, no, not one, one. Here, is it better with the glasses off, see? You look exactly alike. Yeah, I left my red bandana in the, in the other room, but. There uh, you go. Yeah, so, so that's how I got hired. I, I, flew to, I flew for the first time in my life to meet the ship, which was leaving actually from New York. Um, they had made arrangements to get me a passport somehow, which I don't know how to this day they did it. I got on the ship, literally not even knowing the names of the courses I was gonna teach, let alone having read the books or anything. And so thus began my adventure in the falls of 70, where every day I would climb into the lifeboats on the Rhine Dam to get out of everybody's sight and do my prep for the courses I was about to teach the next day. So my, the moral of that story is for any of you, there's always something that you can do that nobody else can do. And, and, and I learned a great lesson that I use all the time when it comes to, to life in general. And that's, you know, I can leave with 24 hours notice was the advantage I had then. And there are other advantages you and I have now. Wow, that's just incredible. I think everybody would agree. What a story. You know, it's not every day you hear that somebody's introduction to our organization is quite that exciting. 
pretty dramatic. And serendipitous and dramatic. I mean, I could think of a lot of words. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's always exciting to hear how, how people have, you know, how this has come about in their life and to think about our own experiences and how semester T came to our lives and everybody's story is different. So that's, what's exciting, I think. Right. Right. So let's dive in deeper, Louis. Um, in your 50, 50 year history with SAS, you developed a love for something pretty unique. And maybe a lot of people don't know this about you, a love for drums. In yes. fact, we learned that you've written a book and only for your family, not one that's quite been published for the public yet. And it's called Drum Hunter. Yes. And in this book, you document the hundreds of drums you've collected from all over the world. So I think you uh, folks listening in would agree with me that we want to hear more about this. This is so unique. So sure, thanks. tell um, us what, what started this passion. Um, it was on the ship that that semester. Um, and dozens of drums were collected as you here's just a sampling of drums over the years. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story of the first drum I ever got. Um, the ship was, the, the itinerary in those days was a little bit different than it is today. We went to places like Pango Pango and Bali, and um, we went to um, American, well, American Samoa is Pango Pango. Um, we went to Darwin, Australia, to the Aborigine lands. Um, and we also went to Freetown in Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. We haven't been to Sierra Leone in the semester, see in 40 years or more. At any rate, um, as many of you will recall from your times on the ship, when you're pulling into a port in the early morning and it's the sun's lit, we all would, would congregate up on the upper decks and we're looking out and watching what's going on the shore and the various greeters that we have. And so the, I've, I've got some stage props to demonstrate this for you because I couldn't just tell us as a story. So when you have grandchildren, you have little boats around all the time. and little toy bridges and toys. We're gonna to say that this is a dock in Sierra Leone, right? And so the ship is coming in to the dock and on one side of the dock where one part of the bridge is, there is a classic colonial brass band playing, a marching band with the locals, uh, Sierra Leoneans in all dress whites. And in the other side of the dock, a uh, couple of hundred yards away is a traditional um, West African drumming troupe, complete with um, the women who are not fully clothed and the men who are barely clothed, pounding away both happily. Now, this was, I believe, called the Queen Elizabeth Key or Dock, brand new, it was less than a year old. It was the pride of Sierra Leone. So you all will recall that, that in all the docks, when the ship is coming in, you have a harbor pilot, right? Harbor pilot comes on board and steers you into the to dock. So to save money, they, the plan was they would go in like this, go in sideways and drop one anchor, which would swing the boat around. So it only would take one tug to make it dock. Well, turned out that our driver had had a little bit too much to drink the night before. And while we're all standing there at three knots, he never made the turn and we collided with the dock, tearing an 18 foot hole in the bow of the ship. So our three day stay in Sierra Leone ended up being uh, seven or 10 days. And each day after the third day, we were only allowed to be away till 6 p.m. because they thought they might have it fixed. Each day they thought they'd have it fixed. So we began, all of us scattered and, and, and I started wandering the streets of, of Freetown, Sierra Leone. And I came upon uh, an old man sitting in a window in a storefront who was making drums. And I'd, I'd been a you know drummer all my life. I pounded on things. I played in rock and roll bands on the ship. I was the only faculty member. I played in drums in the student rock group that played as we went to different ports. Anyway, so I play a little drums. So I was fascinated by this guy's skill and his hands were marvelous. And he was there and his grandson was, was there watching him. So I, I, I wandered in and I, you know, I was staring at him and they speak English too. And he, he said, well, how, um, uh, you know, do, do you want to learn about drums? Do you want to buy drums? What do you What do you do? And I said, No, I'm here on this ship, and I'm just a poor graduate student who just got his first job. And he said, Well, it's fine. You're, you're welcome to come anytime. So every day, 
for six or eight days I came and each day he opened up a little bit more and his grandson would talk to me and his grandson would bring me his grandfather's old, old drum to play and they'd teach me a rhythm and the grandson would play with me and the old man would say, you know, if you, if you really want that drum of mine, I'll, I, I, I could sell it to you for about $300, you know, and I had like $25 to my name and I said, oh, no, thank you much. I'm just, I'm loving what I'm learning. This is fantastic. And each day I'd come back and the price of the drum would go down. So he would say that, you know, well, it's actually, you know, for you, cause I can see you really love it. We, you know, we could do a hundred dollars for this drum. And, and it's, it's a classical, it was a classical drum. So finally, um, it gets down to where the drum is being put up to me for 50 bucks, which I still didn't have. And then I go back to the ship for lunch and we get notified that we're gonna leave at 6 p.m. that night. And so I, in a panic, I go back out to the, to the drum maker, the old man, and I tell him, oh, thank you so much. I give the grandson a hug and he says, well, we're gonna miss you. It's been fun to get to know you, et cetera, et cetera. And I start to amble back to the ship, which is about six blocks away. And I get to the street where you cross to go to the docks. And just as I get there, this old like 50 something banged up Datsun or something pulls up to a halt right back in front of me. The window of the back seat rolls down and there's the grandson. And he sticks out the window, this drum, which I've had all my life. Um, and it's probably close to 100 years old. It's still, it's still. So it's still playable. Um, it has this on these, put, they put these straps on it because in Sierra Leone, they have a tradition of being acrobats. And so they'll put this around them and squeeze it in the middle in the djembe center and do flips while they're still playing their drum. So that was my first drum. It was such a wonderful experience. And our next port was going to be Rio, I think it was. So I decided I'm going to go on another drum hunt. I'm going to allow a little time and just go see if I can find another drum. And thus began the saga of drum after drum after drum. Uh, and the guy, the, the grandson insisted I don't pay anything for it. He just said, my grandfather says, this drum belongs to you. You should have it. Wow. Thank you so much. Honestly, throughout your whole story, I kept feeling chills on my arm. And there were so many pieces to it that were just so exciting. And I think when you started off, I think a lot of the viewers would agree, a lot of our alumni, the first thing you said was you described pulling into the port and how everybody crowds to the front of the ship and looks out and there's always a welcoming committee no matter what country you go to and it's like your gateway and introduction to this new adventure you're about yeah. to take on and i got chills and it just brought me back to that moment and then i was just finding myself so into your story because i didn't have a story or a situation quite like that but i had my own and everyone who sailed in this amazing program has had a similar yet different experience yes. and can really relate to so many messages that came out of that and just like the connection with other humans. And then it started off $300 and then you got it for free. Like that's crazy. And, and the memory of it just will always be with you. And I'm sure that everybody who is watching this, who is connected with semester C, cause I know some aren't, mm -hmm. but you, you know that things change ports close down, there are problems mechanically, you have to change your itinerary, there's a pandemic, there's whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, just in that port in Sierra Leone, because we were there so long, right next to us was docked a Russian fishing factory ship. They catch the fish on the front end, it's cleaned and and on the middle of the ship, then in the bowels of the ship, it's actually canned and packaged and put in boxes and pallets at the rear of the ship. Wow, they talk about there, fresh. They were there for repairs, right? Mm -hmm. They were planned to be there. We were there because of the of crashing into the dock and having this 18 foot hole. You could actually see through into the engines and, and so on in the ship. But we got to make friends with the Russian sailors and crew members and so, it cost me a six pack of beer to get snuck onto the Russian fishing 
factory. And while we were there, I saw that they had set up a volleyball net. And we had a bunch of young guys like myself, and I say young because I was at the time, and, and a lot of the, the students who I saw, you know, we were playing volleyball. So we challenged the Russians for three days at the end of each day, after they would come over because they wanted to see our ship. They wanted to see the Rhine now. Um, and then the, the same kind of thing with, with, with the next one, which was the universe campus. We had a, a, a volleyball tournament between Russia and the US. And the only stipulation I placed on it was we played two out of three, but the first two games would be Russians versus the US, but the third game had to be half and half on each team. So we were, worked on a little bit of diplomacy at the, at the same time. So wow. these things would never have happened had we not rammed the dock. Yeah, At, which I will say for the record, it's extremely uncommon to never happen. That was an anomaly. Would you agree with that? It, it's really not something that happens. Obviously, something went wrong in that moment. But Correct. for anyone worried and listening, you know, I just want to clear it up that that's not a common thing. It's Good point. extremely safe and the measures that are taken are beyond imaginable. Yeah, no, good point, because, you know, I've sent uh, uh, four of my five kids and now that my young grandkids have gone on the ship, <clears> that's <throat> the only time I know of in the 50s or 60s yeah. <laughs> program that anything like that happened. It just happened to happen while I was there and it happened to open the door to, to, to collecting drums. And they, then by the end of that voyage, and, and here's the, the, the other thing I will say, by the end of that voyage, having collected about, uh, I think roughly a half a dozen drums, um, I got into my mind the idea that, because <clears throat> I had already been asked to teach again the next year in the following fall, and then I taught again after that, that I wanted in every port for there to be a true instrument from that port. So I started donating instruments to the ship at that point in time. Um, and some of you who are watching, you will probably have played some of those drums that, uh, well, almost every drum that's on the ship was stuff that I collected over the years and left mm. some of them behind. Uh, and uh, uh, bless their heart at Semester at Sea, every time they change ships, it's not so easy to package and bundle up and, and save all those drums and then and then store them. So they've done a good job and they're now on the on the uh, World Odyssey uh, as well. Um, and then in fact, in the next uh, semester, which is 71 where I taught, the, the music teacher and I, Jim Ketting, the late Jim Ketting, um, we were in Bali and um, I had stumbled upon in some back alley uh, a gamelan factory where they actually make gamelan. Some of you know what the gamelan is. It's like a series of xylophones that they play in concert and they have drums that go with it. And um, it's, <clears throat> and, and Jim said, this is amazing. These are terrific instruments. He had, I think, <laughs> he had about $250 to his name, but then I had about 50. For $300, we bought a whole gamelan set. And that's what's also now on the ship. And it's been there ever since, except the drums got lost in the shuffle somewhere, but the, the main gamelan piece is still on the ship. That's absolutely incredible. And I imagine a lot of our former students and shipmates have all gotten a chance to either see or hear those drums being played. And it's like a little piece of you sails on every voyage. And that's yeah. so special. I don't think anyone else could really say that. That's Some amazing. Some of you will recognize, I just pulled this up in my camera, but this is the the, the student union of the Explorer, right? Yep. You may have seen some of those drums. Those are all drums from my collection that I left on the ship. And, and they are, um, there's about 30 of them. And uh, they, they have, um, uh, they, they range from all parts of the world. And, and fortunately other uh, faculty members and students have left musical instruments on the ship as well because you know how it is when you get on the ship, you, you, you have all this uh, energy and idea and you spend things, you buy things, and then you get to the last port and you say, how the heck am I going to get this home? And so um, there were a lot of musical instruments that have been left over the years on the ship. And, and mm. uh, I was, I was uh, happy to have sort of kicked, kicked off that tradition. I love it. You know, it's so amazing to hear all these stories and when you were speaking, it reminded me of um, a story you shared with me about your drum acquisition in Jamaica specifically. Would you be willing to share that story? Because I think that's a really great one and talk about giving chills. I, I 
I think everybody watching would love to hear that story. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I'll preface it by saying um, uh, we have some other pictures to, to show you that, that, that show some of the other um, places where uh, I've collected uh, drums and other situations. Um, uh, this is some of them. Now, this picture that you see now is in Cape Town, and um, that drum, one of the drums that you see there is this drum right here. And what happened there was going through a really like a commercial area of, of Cape Town, um, I start testing the various drums because I have criteria for what, what drums I'm going <laughs> to buy or ask for, and they have to have uh, they have to be handmade, they have to be one of a kind, they have to have a pl playable intact skin because that's the thing you can never replace. Um, and so I, I, I test drive each of them. So I start to play and I'm playing and maybe somebody who's on this uh, chat with, with me right now was with me. There were three or four people <clears throat> and off from behind the, the one of the rows of shelving comes this guy who just starts dancing to the rhythm that I'm playing. And then the, the owner of the store brings out a drum and he starts playing and pretty soon we have this whole dance and musical ensemble going on. So uh, this, was, this was on a trip to, uh, to Cape Town, uh, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 years ago. And then the next picture um, was a treat. I know I picked this one intentionally because I know many of you uh, sailed with and love Bishop Desmond Tutu. And so here he and I are. Um, this was uh, around um, 2010, I believe, or or a little bit before that. <clears throat> and while I was, we were both interport lecturers for 10 days. Spent 10 days together. And because I went to meet the ship in Takarati, Ghana, and was getting off in Cape Town, I went to Ghana a few days early because it's like drummer's heaven. And while I was uh, waiting for the ship to arrive, I went crawling around on the dock area and I came upon this drum, which is a typical, typical Ghanaian type of drum with pegs for tuning. You pound these in and it makes it the strings uh, webbing tighter, which tightens the drum, makes it higher pitch, but. So um, this is a so-called chief's drum because it has all the, the fancy carvings and so on and so forth. And I got that just as I was about to board the ship, they had some craftsmen had set up shop. So I got that. And then I got on the ship with Bishop Tutu and we can go to the next picture. Um, and then in traveling later, fast forward 20 more years, many of you may have sailed on the enrichment voyages. And it was during the enrichment voyages that we got to visit remote places in Panama and Indian tribes. and. This is the uh, Embera Indians. And I, I finally, that gourd that he's holding in his hand took me three trips for him to part with it. Uh, hmm. And it's now in the Museum, Musical Instrument Museum in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, so all of this is leading up to another part of the world. So um, in each case, when I went on the ship, people found out about my passion for drums. And so I would talk about various uh, drum hunts that people could go on. The real point of the drum hunt is not that you go looking for drums, because I looked for drums, figure out something that is your passion and see what you can find out about it. So that drum, for example, is still here with me and I was very happy. This is about a 125 year old drum. It even had the original sticks intact that were made out of leather and, and twigs and stuff. So um, next picture. Okay, so now we get to what, what Michelle was asking me about, um, a story that I, I told her in our pre-meetings about the drum that I'm holding and how I came to get it. And so what I'd like to do is um, from this uh, book I did for my family, um, I wrote stories that go with each of the, with a, a few select drums. So for example, there's the picture you just saw and here's the story that goes with it. And I'm just gonna read that story and actually be quicker to do than it, if, I, if I told it and embellished on it. Uh, and it makes several of the key points that I would wanna make anyway. So just sort of, you know, either close your eyes or, 
or listen out and relax and, and let uh, let Uncle Louie uh, read you a story. Okay, so uh, this is December 12, 2010. Jamaica is a special place with its own unique cultural recipes seasoned by voodoo, Rastafarians, and reggae. And at the center of the culture is the Nyambingi drum, cone-shaped and tunable via welded and bent rebar and bolts and made in various lengths for tone, Nyabingi drums have also become a favorite of tourists. New mass-produced drums are in dozens of shops, but the older, larger drums are really hard to find. Arriving at the harbor, I, I, I told some friends that I'm heading off for the day on a drum hunt. Three of them had heard about my hunts before, and they did not believe my stories. So, out of curiosity, and skepticism, they invited themselves to tag along with me. I struck a deal with a taxi driver for an all day drive plus a refill of gas or two and off we go. I explained to the driver what I was searching for and I showed him a couple of pictures. So he took us to a couple of music stores which made no sense at all. But one store owner <clears throat> refers me to a shop farther out of town and so off we head in that direction. It was quite a drive. Hungry, we stopped to eat some really good fresh fish at a beachfront shack. Shamelessly, I asked the owner, the chef, the cook, the guy buzzing tables, and the guy who was washing his hands by the bathroom for any leads on old Nyabingi drums. The guy washing his hands gives me one vague tip. He says, there's an old Rastaman who, who sells some old stuff by the side of the road near the top of Green Mountain about 15 miles away. The driver of our taxi gets more directions and off we go. The terrain changes, we gain altitude and the landscape is more and more lush with taller trees and jungle hillsides. All of us in the car are now looking for the Rasta man who is nowhere to be found. The road will end in about a mile as we round the last bend, says our driver. At <clears throat> when suddenly we come upon a series of canvas funky stands. As one sta at one stand, I spot a Rasta man. All he has to sell are some old lanterns and used shoes. Discouraged and with my friend smirking as if to say, way to go, Mr. Drum Hunter, I head back to the taxi. As I'm opening the taxi door on a pole on another stand, I see a photo of Che Guevara. Beside the photo, as if planted there by central casting, for the Bay of Pigs invasion movie, stands a charismatic Rasta man wearing fatigues and a beret and a, with a Cuban flag on it. Having myself just been to Cuba to play baseball, I approached him and I asked him if he's Cuban and what's he doing in, in Jamaica. No, I'm Jamaican, he says, but I joined Fidel Castro and the revolutionaries. That's why everybody calls me the Colonel. I asked him if we could take a photo together. And he agreed and we talked a little bit and walked back to the car. <clears throat> Having nothing to lose, I popped the question to him. You know anyone who has an old Nyabingi drum? Well, yes, I do, man. Back in the hills, I know a guy. I'll take you there, follow me. We all pile in the car, we drive up the road. The taxi driver leans back, to, leans to the side to me and says, I've lived here my entire life, I'm 52 years old. I've never been to this part of Jamaica. So we head further and further in the back roads and we turn a corner, the roads twist and turn and they become ready and almost impassable. And about after three miles of dirt road, we turn a corner and come upon a well-maintained series of modern stucco houses. My friends look at me with concern as if we'd come upon an exclusive housing development for drug lords. The Colonel stops parks his pickup in front of the house, enters the house to dogs barking. He calls out a name and a tall Rasta man about 30 years old strolls out. The Colonel tells me and the others, wait by the car. Fearing the young Rasta might come back out with <clears throat> armed and dangerous, one of my shipmate friends said, let's get the hell out of here. No, I say, we've come all this way, let's play this out. Two minutes later, <clears throat> the Rasta man returns holding a beautiful Nyabingi drum. My friend's jaws drop collectively. The driver literally turns in a circle and lets out a whoop. 
I freeze in my tracks in disbelief. And the beautiful drum is the one that you saw in the picture, but wait, there's more. I have a special treat for you. We have, I have found a video of the handoff of this guy <clears throat> on your left and the Colonel on your right. He is going to give me with his blessings, his drum and tell, tell you about his history. So just, just watch this and be entertained. And also you'll know it's real life because it, the video starts out with him protecting me from getting hit by a car while I'm taking uh, the video. <laughs> so let's see if we can show it. There's no sound, unfortunately. I mean, there is sound in the video, but it's not playing right now. We might be having a little technical difficulty. Yeah. Would you like to keep playing it despite the sound so viewers can get a sense of what you were sharing? Sure. So there's a cab driver. He's still holding his head. There we go. So he's telling me about the drum and <clears throat> he is um, describing what it's made out of. It's made out of a palm a very uh, seasoned palm because it's a, a, a beautiful, healthy one because of the coloration of it. And that he has had it for seven years himself, is made by his, one of his best friends, Timmy, Tim, Timmy. And it's, a, um, it's got a goat skin top and it's got rebar around it in the traditional fashion. See how it's perfectly carved out to get just the right tone. And all of this he's explaining to me, and then he proceeds in typical Rasta fashion to play it with, with certain tones. And he tells me that th these drums are sacred and that he's had this drum for seven years. And, and before that, he had a drum for 13 years, which he gave away to, um, uh, at, at the request of a senior Rastaman who came up to him and looked at it one day at his past, his, uh, his other drum, and said he would love to have it. And so he decided to just give it to him because he felt that man, the Rasta man was special and deserved to have it. And then he says to me, if it weren't for the Colonel there, I wouldn't even be talking to you. But now that I've met you and heard you play a little, I want you to have this drum and I want you to take it with you around the world. Because I understand that you are somebody who's working on a ship and whenever you beat it or anybody else plays it, think of me, think of Jamaica um, and think of all of us who are Rastas. And so that drum is on the ship uh, to this day. <coughs> wow, so absolutely can, incredible. I bet you can't hear the sound because his voice is great and his description is much better than what, what I just did. So um, that drum is on the ship. Some of these others I have around me, but that one is on the ship. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And the visuals really made it all that more special. And sorry about the sound folks. We're uh, having a little technical difficulty, but nevertheless, it was a great story and your recollection of it is just so incredible to hear and all the thoughts that went on in your head as this was happening. So thank you. I think at this point, um, I wanna ask you one last thing. So I know that in addition to the Drum Hunter book, you've also written a book for entrepreneurs. And I think you had shared with me, it's called Make Your Own Waves, The yeah. Surfer's Rules for Entrepreneurs and Innovators. Right. There we go. Now, I understand that your writing of this book was inspired by your time on the ship as well. So tell us a little bit about that book briefly and how you did connect that back to SAS. Yes. Um, well, being on the ocean is an incredible experience for anybody. And having had the chance to spend close to three years of my life at sea in one semester or another or in other situations. Uh, and growing up in Southern California, I've always had the ocean as part of my life. Um, we, we particularly are fond of a place in Kauai that I went to on the ship um, called Hanalei, the little town of Hanalei. And uh, even my, young, <clears throat> my youngest daughter got married in Hanalei uh, uh, in 2018 and so on. So um, my affinity for the ocean would, would of course expose me to water sports. So um, I'm a terrible surfer, but I, I love and admire um, this, this sport of surfing. 
And so the <clears throat> um, advent, uh, the combination of my love for the ocean and my experience on the ship where I was always trying to kind of listen to the ocean and learn from the sounds and the motion and, and, and the unpredictability and the reminder that we're just little, we're just grains of sand in the, in the world compared to the, the ocean. Um, the, the, uh, the impetus for the book really came from wanting to do something where I, uh, in the world of business, it's hard to find anything new to write about. <clears throat> so I was trying to figure out how can I juxtapose what I learned on the ship, what I love about the ocean and what I know about business and innovation. And I got this crazy idea when I met a couple of uh, big wave surfers. These are men and women who ride 50 to 80 foot waves. Um, they're only about 100, 150 in the whole world. That's a manageable group. And I thought I should, you know, I want to pick their brain. So I started talking to, to big wave surfers about their experiences and how they train, how they keep in physical condition, how they build a team around them because big wave surfing, like business, is a team sport. Um, how they uh, take care of their safety and those and the safety of others, you know, and and when how do you launch a business? It's kind of like here's this big wave, and are you going to be able to ride it or are you going to wipe out? So the analogies are sometimes very simplistic, but they're very real. So I started interviewing uh, big wave surfers. I got this idea for make your own waves, where each chapter would be uh, would would start and be labeled according to what. I call the surfers rules. And so the chapter titles are all drawn from, um, from the vernacular of surfing. Um, up probably easier to do quick, there are two words and three words. So the first chapter is called Learn to Swim. Second chapter is called Get Wet. The third, Decide to Ride. The fourth, Always Look Outside. Outside in surfing or out the back in surfing is the wave behind the wave behind the wave. <clears throat> so you not only know what wave to take, but what might be coming in the distance? That's something I learned on the ship. You don't necessarily go for the very first thing, the shiny object in front of you or the thing that you were looking to buy. Sometimes it's the one behind the, the back of the shop or it's the one in the distance. Um, the fifth chapter is called Commit, Charge, Shred. That's halfway through the book. First time I talk about riding a wave because it's all about preparation. Same I would say to anybody watching this, this video at, at right now, um, who's thinking about coming on the ship. It's all about preparation. Prepare yourself to, to meet the world, Pre prepare for what you're gonna bring, uh, prepare your mind, prepare your emotions. Sixth chapter is called Paddle Back Out because inevitably, inevitably there will be setbacks, wipeouts, uh, and they can, they can be things that you learn from. Uh, the seventh chapter is called Never Turn Your Back on the Ocean. The next chapter, chapter eight, is called Prepare Big. The uh, second to last chapter is Never Surf Alone, which everybody at Semester C understands. And the uh, last chapter is called Stay Stoked. All of those put together. Now that book is available on, on everywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. That's the one that most recently went on Amazon number one for surfing. And it was also NASDAQ book of the month for business books. So I guess both audiences uh, enjoyed it. So, <clears throat> but I do owe it to the initial insights I had about myself and about um, the ocean from, from being able to, to be on the ship and travel as much as I did. I, I, last December before the pandemic, fortunately um, I hit countries number 101 and 102. So I've met, I, I met the century mark in uh, countries visited and uh, I know that wanderlust that most of you watching this can understand, and I'm sure you're you're heading towards any number that you can as as often as you can. Incredible! Thank you so much. Wow. I think we are kind of rounding the curve here to the end of our time together. I definitely want to make sure there's time for questions. I have maybe one or two for you, but I also wanted to open up to anyone watching. Um, type your questions in the comment section below so that we can filter through and see if there's anything that we'd like to get addressed. I want to shout out to a couple of people who have been watching and appreciate your support. Mary, Mort, Autumn, anyone else I miss, thanks for joining in. 
And uh, can I ask you one question kind of as we're waiting for other questions to come in? Sure. Awesome. I think, you know, on a bigger picture, a uh, bigger scale type of a question compared to the, the things we've been talking about, I want to know if you, from your life experiences with semester C in all these years and all the generations you, you push forward to have this experience as well, what advice would you give to anyone considering sailing on SAS? And I'm talking about either as an undergraduate student, someone who wants to apply to be a faculty or staff member, or even sailing as a lifelong learner, which if, if those watching don't know that program, I encourage you to go take a look at our website, uh, semesterc.org, and learn a little bit about the lifelong learner experience, because it's definitely a special experience that you can't get anywhere else. So right. with all of that together, do you have any straightforward advice that you would share to anyone wanting this experience? Well, great question. Um, my immediate response would be beg, borrow, or steal, or do anything you can or need to do to be able to go up for at least a semester at sea. Uh, it is a life-changing experience, and I've lived a long time and had a, a lot of experiences. Um, and to this day, nothing compares to what I learned about the world and learned about myself on semester at sea. It helped me become more independent. It helped me see the world through other people's eyes. Um, I, my, one of my favorite phrases, my, uh, the high school Spanish teacher that I took some lessons with used to say, the way to get to know other cultures is to learn to flip the tortilla. Um, the semester C helped me see the world from the other perspectives, from other people's point of view. Part of the reason that I love the drum hunt so much is because it's really, A, it's off the wall. Mm -hmm. It leads me quickly into the non-touristy parts of the world. There's a lot more to the world when you travel than going to uh, museums and churches and, um, and gift shops. Those will all be there in the long haul, but what is disappearing are rural ways of life. Uh, children's eyes looking at you as though they'd, they'd seen an alien from outer space because they'd never seen a white person before. Th these are experiences you cannot replicate. Um, for those of you who did not have the opportunity to sail or your kids did, but you never did get the opportunity as uh, is often the case, Lifelong Learners is a wonderful way to do it. And you can do it for a whole semester. And in some voyages, you can do it from one port to another. Um, as the pricing of such things go, it's very, 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 very reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic, of course, has shut all the cruise industry down. But when it, when it reopens, do keep it on your, on your list of things that, that you want to do. And for prospective students, um, I, would, I would just uh, encourage you to, um, to make it a priority. Uh, I know there are year abroad programs galore uh, where you go to one place and you stay put and you do get language immersion, but there's nothing like this experience where let's say we are all on a ship right now and Michelle and I and you are talking um, about uh, how yesterday we were just in um, Rio de Janeiro um, and, um, and then uh, we turn to each other and say, but you know, in eight days from now, we're gonna be in Cape Town. And so you have a whole other world, another continent, another culture. So it's a kind of study and studying abroad, so to speak, that's even more than abroad, it's a studying globally that you cannot replicate. So uh, I, 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 would, I would really encourage you to, to do it. And, and as a parent, to the parents, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful program. It will change your, your, your kids for the better. Also, I will say that um, there have been 60,000 graduates or so, right, alumni of, of Semester at Sea. Once you've sailed on the ship, which usually has 500 to 600 people, doesn't matter which voyage you were on. You will have friends and, mm -hmm. and places to stay and invitations. A network. And meals all over the world. And it's, it goes in every which direction. Even, for example, in this book, the epilogue at the end of the book was written by Kathy Rogers, who is who I met. We didn't sail together, but Kathy was on is on the board. She's currently the chair of the Parents Council. Um, we met a few years ago at the board meetings and kept in touch. And she is a sympathetic spirit and soul. And I asked her if she'd be so kind. She was the vice president of IBM and would make a perfect 
business person to comment on the book. So it extends and extends and it extends and it, it doesn't go away. It'll be with you your whole life. I agree. I think there's a shared experience, even if you didn't have the exact experience, because it's just so unique. And I agree with you. I, I, I formerly worked with college students for, for most of my, all of my career. And I pushed semester at sea more than they wanted me to. And they were sick of hearing about it. But I just couldn't stop talking about the uniqueness of the program, how it opened your eyes. I mean, it's like you were saying, like, I just have memories on the voyage that I had the privilege to sail on. You know, I'm in India one day and 10 days later, I'm in Egypt. I mean, you can't get more opposite of cultures than those two cultures. And just, it's like constant learning. Your brain is on overdrive in a good way. And it's just absolutely the best experience, whether you're a college student or a staff or faculty, it's life-changing. So definitely, if you have interest in this program, you'll be us one day telling stories. So drive forward, raise funds, talk to your home campus, figure out a way to make it happen. You'll never, ever regret it. And uh, you can see from two enthusiastic alum here and there's thousands and thousands more out there who can say the same thing. There's, there's no other experience like it and we would, wouldn't change it for the world. And you know, in the spirit of of paying it forward, our, our family decided because it's such a part of our life to set up a scholarship fund um, in perpetuity. <clears throat> it's not a big fund, but it helps a little bit each semester. And the one stipulation of this fund that we've set up is it has to go to a student who's the first in their family to go to college as I was. So <clears throat> my kids have all been blessed with being able to go to college, but I, I, I had to fend for myself and I know how tough it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, we've set up that scholarship, but the, the, for you who are alums, just keep semester at sea in mind in ways that you can contribute. It doesn't have to necessarily be financially. You can volunteer your time. You can be working on recruiting. There's lots of things to do. And, and it, it really is uh, playing it forward and sustaining, mm -hmm. sustaining semester at sea for the future. I absolutely agree. And as you consider giving back to causes you care about, just remember that Semester at Sea is a 501c3 nonprofit. So this is the time we need your support more than ever. Um, Louie and I are both donors ourselves as he shared his family scholarship fund, which is just phenomenal. I don't have much to give. I have a young family. Shout out to my kids who are watching as well. But uh, one way that I like to give back, it's so easy. And in addition to you know, directly uh, giving money to the organization for certain purposes. I always shop on Amazon, like most of you do. And if you simply type smile.amazon.com, it brings you to a page where you can donate a portion of what you spend to any nonprofit organization out there. Needless to say, Semester at Sea Institute of Shipboard Education is on there. And even if it's like three cents or 45 cents every purchase I make, it adds up. And I feel so good about that at the end of the day. And I could justify all that spending because it's a way to give back. And as anyone out there might guess, the organization uh, is fighting through these hard times, just like much of our world. And we're going to get through it. And it takes the support of alumni and donors out there to really keep us and sustain us. So keep that in mind. And um, at this point, Louis, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll add is that um, <clears throat> for me, it was drums that helped me find a passion in, in my life. Um, everybody has those things. And it's, it's something that's very special. And only you have them. I'll close with one short story. After I found <clears throat> the, um, the, the drum in um, uh, <clears throat> that I told you about, the Rasta drum, I was talking on the ship about it uh, and doing my talk to the whole student body about drum hunting. And <clears throat> this was on an enrichment voyage, in, actually. And <clears throat> so there's all ages. So uh, I come back from that experience and I'm showing them the, the the, the people, the new drum. Um, and then this is on the um, Explorer. And the, there was this hallway on the Explorer that led through the piano lounge, it's kind of crossroads central. So the next 
day we go to the next time we go to another port and we come back and I'm walking down the hallway just after on ship time and this couple and they are in their 80s and they're like five feet two and they're cute as can be and they're holding hands and they're walking up to me like happy go lucky I, I had no idea what was going on I said hi how are you guys doing and they said we have to talk to you we have to talk to you I said okay what's up what 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 they said she says the the, the lady says I love buttons <laughs> I love wooden buttons and what? you know what? I don't care about drums but I love buttons <laughs> so my husband and I when we got into port we asked around about where we could find some old buttons and you know what happened we found a button factory and a the guy who owned it was close to our age and he had boxes of, of leftover buttons and he was so intrigued and happy to see somebody else from America that loved buttons that he asked us to have lunch and dinner and stay the night with his family and we're just coming back from that and we couldn't be higher. And so, wow. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that happens as the ripple effect from mm -hmm. being on the ship happens to all of us. Yeah, things you can't predict and you certainly can't make up. Amazing. Thank you so, so, so much, Louie. You've enriched our life by sharing your stories. Thank you to our SAS alumni and friends and prospective participants. We are so glad you joined us today. And I wanted to just plug next Wednesday. We have on November 11th from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We have a discussion with another alumni. His name is Mike Marion, and he sailed in spring of 2003 as the ship photographer and then went on to work for Semester C for 14 years. So many of you watching who are alumni probably know him. And he will be interviewed by another friend of mine and fabulous alumni in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, Rowan Akron, and she's the president of the Alumni Association at this point. So how exciting, another couple of new perspectives and probably lots of great stories and questions to be answered. So once again, thank you so much. If you know anyone who is uh, also an alum, maybe has an interesting story and wants to do what we're doing right now, Send them to wavelengths at semesterc.org. Have them uh, share their story, connect with our folks back at ISE, and maybe they can be part of another wavelength series in the future. So thank you again, everyone. Have a good night, and we will see you next week.